Today we will talk about the fierce warriors of the steppes of Essos, the so-called Dothraki Sea. What do you remember about the Dothraki, some years after the series? Well, they're the kind of tame cavalrymen Daenerys used to intimidate all her enemies. Those who were impressed by Game of Thrones will recall Khal Drogo, Vyas Dothrak, and the burning of the Great Khals. No more. The reason I mention the series is because while the book version is one of the coolest world fantasy series ever, the HBO TV adaptation has a much larger audience reach, as an example. Personally, I only started reading A Song of Ice and Fire after I saw the first episodes of the initial season of Game of Thrones. Before that, I knew, of course, about the existence of this story, but treated it like any other often-mentioned literary fantasy series. In this review, I will try to give a little more information about the fierce nomads of Essos. First of all, the nomadic nature of the Dothraki must be fixed. George Martin mentioned that his Dothraki are a composite image of real-life historical nomads, Huns, Mongolo-Tartars, and others. That's why the Dothraki turned out to be such warlike destroyers, a terror from the steppe, wiping out cities and kingdoms. To generalize steppe cultures with the conquests of Genghis Khan and Batyi, is akin to judging sedentary Europeans by the Germanic raids on the Roman Empire and the Slavic invasions of Byzantium during the Great Migration of Peoples. But let's forgive the writer the use of stamps and common perceptions. Still, he is not a professional historian. However, according to Martin's descriptions and purely visual impression, that in Dothraki feels something of motives of Indian culture and some Scythians, Sarmatians, other exotics, and not only classical Eurasian nomads of the Middle Ages. Martin does not write much about the origin of this people. It is known that the Dothraki began to gain strength relatively late, after the collapse of the old Valyria. Anyway, in the New World without Valyrians and their dragons, they began to control all the steppe regions of central Essos, which became known as the Dothraki Sea. After the increasing military power of the nomadic peoples, their onslaught was experienced by the neighboring sedentary peoples. Thus, one of the Dothraki chieftains, the Khals, briefly united all the steppe tribes under his rule and spread Dothraki influence to the west. His descendants and followers over the next few decades ravaged and destroyed the rich kingdom of Sarnor, located northwest of the prairies of the Dothraki Sea. After the fall of Sarnor, the Dothraki probably ravaged the Valyrian city of Isaria, located west of the Sarnor Confederacy. To the north, the mainland possessions of the Abenians suffered greatly. However, further westward movement was stopped by Quachor. In a battle near the city, a squad of unsullied hired by the Quachorians was able to inflict terrible losses on the Dothraki horde. The Dothraki were forced to retreat back into the steppes. In the south, the steppe ravaged the lands of the Giscars and Quatians. The northern cities of Giscar were destroyed, and the Quatians had only the city of Quat survived. The people of the Dothraki Sea also carried out an onslaught to the east. Some local settled communities were devastated, others resisted the steppe warriors. Either way, after a hundred years of furious raids and campaigns, the Dothraki had calmed down a bit. In addition, the settled cities were able to find an acceptable form of coexistence with them. Somewhere it was trade and in some places the townspeople paid regular tribute to the steppes. They paid off raids. It turned out that it was more profitable and safer to sell livestock and other byproducts of animal husbandry, as well as to receive regular fixed payments, than to go on risky campaigns. At times, however, the Dothraki drew their blades and bows and showed off their prowess to the townsfolk. Besides, no one cancelled skirmishes between individual Kalasars. Speaking of Kalasars, Martin writes that Khal Drogo could field tens of thousands of horsemen. Here we are not talking about some separate tribes and clans, but communities comparable to the possessions of some individual Khans from real history. If we translate the number of Drogo's subjects into settled language, we can compare it with Slavic or Germanic unions of tribes, Goths, Vandals, Alemanni, Viatici, and others. In other words, the Kalasars were proto-state formations, and their leaders, the Khals, were quite powerful people of their time not just tribal princes. So when Daenerys married Khal Drogo, she became the Khaleesi of a powerful community, while the Khal merely honoured a refugee, yes, a noble heiress to the Targaryen monarchy. 
but with nothing but the glitter of ancestral glory. It is quite clear why George Martin emphasizes the warlike nature of the Dothraki. After all, they are needed, above all, as a tool of the Mother of Dragons in her claims to the Seven Kingdoms. Therefore, no special information about the basis of the nomadic economy of the Dothraki is given. It is clear that horse breeding was one of the most important occupations of all Kalasars. Probably, they also bred other livestock and traded their derivatives with sedentary peoples. Judging by their light clothing, their habits of conducting all significant rituals outdoors and other indirect signs, the Dothraki Sea had a rather mild climate. The tradition of braids among Dothraki men has an analogy among many historical peoples. Such hairstyles were worn by nomadic Turkic peoples, Kidans, Mongols, Manchus, some Indian tribes of North America. In religious aspect, it is possible to allocate monotheistic character of Dothraki beliefs. The only deity was the great stallion, which is not surprising at all. In general, the Dothraki regarded those without horses as inferior and incapable, and this too is understandable. There was one exception to the Kalasar's completely nomadic way of life. The city of Vias Dothrak was the only stationary settlement of the steppes. However, to call it a full-fledged city is a stretch. Rather, it is a large trading and religious center, where Dothraki from all Kalasar come from time to time. Notably, Vias Dothrak is ruled by the widows of deceased Khalsa, thus emphasizing their special role in the society. Also, the Dosh Kalina, Council of Widowed Khaleesi, performs religious functions in Dothraki society. The sacred nature of Vias Dothrak is emphasized by the fact that no Dothraki is allowed to enter there with weapons, much less use them. Thus, the city is very often used for negotiations between the Khals to work out some common positions. The Khals themselves are not hereditary rulers, although their sons may inherit the title. The situation when a large Kalasar disintegrates after the death of a Khal is not so rare. In such a fragile social structure lies a significant difference from the real historical Eurasian nomads. In the latter, blood ties played the most important role. However, if we compare Kalasars with tribal unions or nomadic Khanates, the difference does not seem so great. However, there is no point in developing the topic further, simply because Martin himself did not pay much attention to the nuances of the clan tribal system of the inhabitants of the Dothraki Sea. But the creators of the TV version developed a separate Dothraki language for the movie, Dothrakin, which appeared in the Dothraki episodes of Daenerys Targaryen. This fictional language has its own structure. Here is the basic information about the nomadic Dothraki in A Song of Ice and Fire. One could go into a little more detail on each point, but anyway, it will not be possible to add some fundamentally new information, because they are not in the primary sources. However, perhaps I missed something. In this case, I ask at least in two or three words to indicate about such shortcomings in the comments. The author of A Song of Ice and Fire had no need for more detailed work with the nomads of Essos. They are an ancillary element in Danny's story arc, nothing more. Nevertheless, turned out the riders, furrowing the expanses of the Dothraki Sea, bright and quite original guys. When constructing them, the creator used historical analogies with the really existing peoples, their social and everyday life, as well as his own ideas. The latter endowed the Dothraki with individual features, making them an independent people, rather than the Scythians' guns Mongols transferred to the fantasy soil. Martin's talent as a writer is once again evident in this.